So, bro, Brother Zion Lex, get back to you. Because the last time, see, I haven't been on camera with you for a while. So, we got to go all the way back. What happened with you and Jabari, man? What happened with know. you and Jabari on Sarnetta TV? What was all the smoke about? Because I know you don't run away from, from topics. No, 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 no. So would you care to explain Absolutely. exactly what happened? All right, so let me, let me take it from the top. Uh, because I did hear that Zion Lex showed up to Brother Jabari's house unannounced and kind of bum-rushed it, as we Caribbeans would say, or, or bum-rushed it, as uh, black Americans would say. And um, the reality is I was invited. Uh, I called Divine Prospect. I said, hey, are you en route to this secret location where we're supposed to have this dialogue? And he laughed. What you mean secret location? I'm like, nobody told me. He goes, all right, I'm at Jabari's house. Come through. So I heard him, but I didn't pay that attention because Jabari didn't invite me. Sarnetta then picked up his phone because I called him next. And he said, hey, we at Jabari house. Come there. So sure enough, I pull up. And as I pull up to Jabari's house looking for um, parking, Jabari comes outside. Apparently, Sonata told him that I was there. And Jabari looked at me, and Jabari said, Hey, Zion Lex, come on, hurry up. You can find parking. It's right there. Go ahead. So, you know, contrary to popular opinion, I was given an official invite from the man himself. Now, to his credit, he didn't know I was coming that day to his home. It was just told to him. But nonetheless, the, the brother extended his, his home to me. So we had the dialogue, and the dialogue centered around the idea of whether or not henotheism was the precursor um, to monotheism in pre-exilic Israel, or other, in other words, in layman's terms, the idea of the creator, the God of the universe, being a monotheistic uh, deity. Is that something that was foreign to Israelites pre-exile, or is that something that we picked up post-exile, hence after Babylon and all the other captivities? So I stood on the side of the dialogue that monotheism has been at the genesis of Hebrew history. And by genesis, I mean that both literally and figuratively, beginning with Father Abraham. Father Abraham is considered in academic circles today the father of monotheism. We know that when we speak to our brothers in the Kemetic faith that they like to speak of Pharaoh Akhenaten. But, you know, need I remind them, Akhenaten is between the 14th and 13th centuries BCE. Father Abraham is the 22nd century BCE. Or even if we stretch it to the date that most academics believe, we're talking about the 18th or 19th century BCE. So he's still five to six hundred years before Akhenaten of Kemet. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, bar none, Monotheism comes out of the Semitic lineage. It's a Semitic um, concept birthed by Father Abraham. And of course, we know that there were ancestors before Abraham that only saw and invited the creator of the universe as being a single deity. Hence, we know from um, Adam to Noah is about 10 generations, right? And from Noah to Abraham is another 10 generations, right? So all of those 20 generations all knew about one God. Now, there were people in between that definitely ventured off and did their own thing. But as far as our faith as Hebrews is concerned, from its very genesis, we perfectly understood how we envisage the Creator. He is one without equal, no partner. He doesn't have a physical um, manifestation in the, in the form of an avatar, as our brother Divine Prospect um, wanted to suggest about this term Elohim, that, you know, Yahweh or Yehovah would be the avatar of Elohim, which I said really didn't make sense because we know that the term Elohim is a title and we know that the term Yahweh is the proper name of the God of the Bible and that name is the highest attribute of that entity, the God of the Bible, and the term Elohim is beneath it. So Yahweh could not be an avatar of Elohim when on the totem pole, Yahweh would be here and Elohim as a title would be here. There's, as they would say in today's terms, there's levels to this. We know that there's about 10 divine names used throughout scripture, right? El Shaddai, uh, El Roy, you know, uh, El Chai, you know, several uh, El 
Rakum, the merciful one. Wow. You know, we could go on for days. Um, Yehovah Sefa'ot, the Lord of hosts. You know, but the highest attribute or the highest name, make no doubt about it, is yod heh vav -Hey. Elohim is significant as a title in that this is the attribute responsible creatively with creation. This is the attribute of the creator that is working through the mechanics of creation, creating man, creating other animals, creating other inanimate and animate uh, subjects and objects, but they all have a moral base and foundation that they all respond to. That is why this name is significantly used throughout the entire first chapter of Genesis. Some academians question why we don't see Yahweh in the first chapter. Yahweh as a name of the Creator is speaking of his essence being divorced from man. This is a level of the Creator that the average man can't get close to. You have to have high morality to get close to this level of the Creator. Hence this name was only revealed to the children of Israel. Everybody throughout the world, all nations have a proper name of God, then they have a title. The nation of Israel have proper name of God, yod heh vav -Hey, and then there are several titles that follow it. But none of those titles of the Creator are equal to His proper name, per se. So, for me, the dialogue was powerful because Brother Divine Prospect is a major force in the Messianic community, and in my opinion, he represents a very high level of scholarship. In fact, I think in several areas he sets the bar. You know, I, I, and when I say set the bar, and, and when I emphasize in several areas, I'm also saying that I'm not walking in those lanes with him. I want to make that clear. Um, one thing that makes me great, if anything makes me great, is the idea that I give ear to something before I give my lips to something. I'm willing to listen before I'm willing to speak. What I've learned throughout my dialogues with Divine Prospect is that notwithstanding our differences, none of our difference of opinion or thoughts takes away from or stains my perception of his intellect. This is a brother with high intellect. This is a person who has the ability to read and catch on very quick. So I thought that our dialogue was excellent and I believe Brother Jabari changed the spirit in the room that evening because in Jabari's own words and I'm pretty sure we could segue that into the video once we edit wow. this video and brother Jabari's own words after having listened to me and Divine Prospect's dialogue he said verbatim you know it was hard to have to sit through this I mean you guys speak of Abraham as if he was historic you guys speak of of Isaac and Jacob as if these are historical characters and you know I, I just want to let you guys know and I'm speaking from Jabari's perspective I just want to let you guys know that there's nothing wrong with myth, you know. Abraham could be, still be important and also be a myth. But I just have an issue with you guys making Abraham historical. So I stepped in. And I brought some balance to the dialogue. And I said, well, what are some of the components that make Abraham not a historical uh, personality or, or personage? And he said, well, you know, for instance, um, we can't find a body for Abraham. You know, there's no, where, where's Abraham's grave? Well... We, we know where Abraham's grave is. It's a site that's visited every year by the millions. Right. No one is allowed to exhume Abraham's body because in Hebraic thought, we don't practice exhumation of our deceased ancestors. The remains of our deceased ancestors we hold sacred. The closest and the furthest you're allowed to do is get close to the memorial built where their bones are laid. But you could never examine it. This, these are some of the facets of our culture, of our history, of our heritage that we deem holy and sacred. That we don't defile in the sense that we're opening up to museums, you know, for anyone to put their hands on and do whatever it is that they want to do with it. And people have to understand that when we're talking intercultural relationships, what works in Kemet is not necessarily what works in Israel. So while the science of mummification is a brilliant science that the African mind envisaged and achieved, it was still not the practice of another African people, the Hebrews. The Hebrews placed a little bit more respect on the remains of their deceased ancestors because for the Hebrews, preservation of that which was immaterial, the spiritual practice 
meant more. Vice versa, preservation of that which is material, the body. So while the ancient Egyptians felt the need to uh, overemphasize the preservation of the intact human body for the sake of what they call enjoying the afterlife, the Hebrews placed more emphasis and more focus on preservation of that which is immaterial, which is our intellect, our spiritual practice, the Torah. So I simply said to Brother Jabari, well, if Abraham doesn't exist because we can't find a grave, then you have to wipe out almost the entire first two dynasties in ancient Kemet. You don't have a grave for Narma. You don't have a grave for Menai or Menes. Where are the graves for some of your early dynastic kings? So are we to now believe that because we can't find a grave, they never existed? But let's take it a step further because we can look in recent history and apply some of your logic. Many of our ancestors, by the hundreds of thousands, didn't survive the Middle Passage. Many of their bodies cannot and have not been found. Are we to now negate the Middle Passage? Are we now to negate a major part of the transatlantic slave trade so as to suggest that because we cannot find these bodies, this atrocity never occurred? And what would we be doing then? We'd be giving in to the narrative and the dialogue of our oppressor, who's basically now saying that it didn't exist on the level that we're saying it existed because of the fact that they can't find the bodies. So the oppressed are now adopting the views of the oppressor when we give credence to some of the ill-fated logic that the oppressor is using to negate our story. If Europeans have a habit of negating African history because of a technicality, and we as African people begin to do the same thing to each other, well, where I'm from, in Laban's terms, we hustling backwards. And that's how I looked at Brother Jabari, because rather than point to the fact that here is two different Hebrew schools of thought that just went through a beautiful dialogue, expressed different views, and were powerful in their emotion, in their vivid imagination of conceiving those views, and related it to the people in a way that was brotherly and friendly, and everyone in the room and the lookers on online loved it, and then comes now a spirit of well, you know, for me, it, it wasn't a great dialogue because, you know, Abraham doesn't even exist. I had to challenge that. So, the mishap between myself and Brother Jabari, for me, began with what I would like to call um, his um, tendency to downplay the rich and highly credible narrative of the Torah simply to overemphasize and create this aura of greatness around Kemet and Kemet alone. So that's where I stand in terms of um, that particular experience with Brother Jabari. Thank you, Brother.